Today I'm here with Dr. Neil Barnard, who is the president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. He started the Barnard Medical Center. He's written a plethora of books, and the one we're going to be talking about today is Power Foods for the Brain, which has just had a huge impact on, for me, because we just saw my, my mother-in-law pass on totally from Alzheimer's, totally preventable, but not when she gets to that level. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, it's great to be back with you. Well, we're going to talk today specifically about foods that protect you from harmful fats and cholesterol. So first, can you tell me what is a blue zone and what lessons can we learn from the blue zones? Yeah, the blue, National Geographic sent Dan Butner out. Dan Butner is a, was, a, was and is a researcher with the National Geographic. They sent him out to look at those parts of the world where you had the most centenarians, the most people living to be 100 and beyond. And they marked them on a map in blue. So they're called the blue zones. Um, and some of them, well, there's one of them in the United States. It's Loma Linda, California. And also uh, Sardinia is one. There's part of Greece. There's a part of Costa Rica. But the one where you have the most centenarians of all is Okinawa, Japan, the very bottom of uh, the southern end of Japan. And what Butner then did is, okay, why are there so many people living to be 100 here? And he looked at a number of lifestyle characteristics, um, how much you exercise, the sense of community, the sense of family, and all that kind of stuff. But to my read, the thing that emerges the, the strongest is what they are eating. In Okinawa, the dietary staple is not fish, which you, you might think. In fact, it's not even rice. It's sweet potatoes, phenomenal amounts of sweet potatoes. They eat very, very little meat, very little animal products in general. In Loma Linda, California, the whole, the entire reason why Loma Linda is a blue zone, it's about an hour east of LA. The whole reason is that it's an area where many Seventh-day Adventists live. And Seventh-day Adventists, by church teachings, are non-smokers, non-drinkers. They don't have caffeine and they're supposed to be vegetarian. And then within the Adventists, the ones who aren't vegetarian don't look like a blue zone at all, but the ones who are, and especially the ones who are vegan do the best. So anyway, bottom line, uh, the blue zones are a neat way of profiting from what you might almost call a natural experiment where people have selected mm -hmm. their own diets and their own lifestyles. And you see these dramatic differences in how long people live. And as uh, in addition, you see the same differences in disease prevalence as well. Was there a common theme throughout all these blue zones? More plants, less animals. That's, that's really the biggest theme. They're not necessarily non-smokers. They're not necessarily teetotalers and whatever. They differ a lot in their religious practices and the other kinds of things that you think might weigh in. But there's a consistent theme that they're the ones who are eating their beans and their green vegetables and their fruits and so forth. And some of them have most of them have some animal products, except in Loma Linda, the ones who do the absolute best are the ones who get away from animals. Completely. Altogether. All, yeah, altogether. Okay. Well, let's talk fat. Okay. Uh, what's the difference between saturated fat, partially hydrogenated oils, and trans fat? And where are we going to find these things in the diet? Uh, saturated fat is something I learned about as a little kid because my mother cooked bacon for all her kids. I will never forget this. She would take the bacon out of the hot pan and then she would pour that bacon grease into a jar. And she put the jar on the shelf just to save it, not in the refrigerator. Over time, as that jar cooled down, it turned into this white waxy solid. The fact that it's solid at room temperature means it's very high in saturated fat. On the other hand, if you had say a bottle of corn oil, you pour it into the jar, you can wait for 10 years. It's not gonna turn into a solid fat. In fact, you, you throw it in the refrigerator, cool it down, it still doesn't get solid. That's high in polyunsaturated fat. And there's one in between the two, and that's monounsaturated. So that's olive oil or um, canola oil. Pour it into a jar, it's liquid. Put it in the fridge, it's solid. So the name, by the way, the name saturated or polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, what they mean is a fat molecule. If you look at it under a powerful microscope, what you would see is it's a chain of carbon atoms, all linking hands, one after another, after another, after another, after another. And hydrogen atoms coat the outside of it. 
And if it's saturated with hydrogen atoms, in other words, if there's a hydrogen atom everywhere one could attach, it's a saturated fat. If you take off one hydrogen atom, it's now mono unsaturated. If you take off a whole bunch of them, it's poly unsaturated. Mm. So, so anyway, that's the chemistry of it. But you can see it, you know, on my mom's kitchen counter. Uh, the saturated fats are the ones that are solid uh, at room temperature, and that's bacon grease. Main source, I, actually, though, is not bacon. It's cheese and uh, other, uh, yeah, mm. <laughs> and other dairy products. Dairy products are the number one source of saturated fat. Well, what's trans fat? Okay, trans fat is where manufacturers got the idea that they wanted to substitute for butter. So they took an innocent liquid oil and they added hydrogen atoms to it to make it similar to butter or similar to a, 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 a saturated fat. And the, so trans fats is a, a liquid oil that has been chemically hardened. They call this process hydrogenation, meaning I'm throwing hydrogen atoms into it and you hydrogenate it enough and it'll turn into a waxy solid too. Is that good for us? No, it's terrible. <laughs> it's, it's the trans fats. Um, you'll see them on a label. They may not list it as trans fats. They may call it partially hydrogenated oil, but it will make your arteries snap closed just in the same way that butter will. But, but I'm, I'm being a little tongue in cheek, but what I mean to say is if you eat trans fats, it'll raise your cholesterol just like, just like uh, the saturated fats right. in, in dairy products or meat. Well, for in, the, in our last video, we discussed the relationship between fat and metals. And right. for those of you who hadn't seen this video or read the book, oh my gosh, give us a quick overview of the relationship between fat and metals. Okay. In your, your body needs a certain amount of iron. It needs a certain amount of copper. These are, are, are they're metals, but your body needs little traces. You know, you need iron for hemoglobin right. to transport oxygen in your red blood cells. You need uh, copper for a variety of enzymatic functions. Uh, this will not be on the test. Um, but as time goes on, these metals oxidize in your body in, in the same way that a cast iron pan oxidizes when it rusts that happens in your body. And that appears to trigger the production of free radicals, these maladjusted molecules in your bloodstream that can damage the brain and the combination of bad fat, saturated fat and high levels of these transitional metals like copper, they add together to increase your risk of brain damage. I'm talking about specifically Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. However, however, the bad fats alone appear to have this effect. When, the, when researchers in Chicago have measured the fat that people are eating, those who eat the most bad fat, whether it's saturated fat in cheese or bacon or trans fat, they have a higher risk of Alzheimer's. I mean, a lot higher risk, and, and, and that, that's frightening, but, but it, it's empowering because what that means is, okay, my parents had Alzheimer's and my grandparents had Alzheimer's. I don't want that to happen to me. Good. Let's avoid, the, the, let's not have the foods that are high in, in saturated fat. I'm not sure if I can reduce your risk to zero, but I think you can reduce it a lot. So out with the bacon, in with the veggie bacon, out with the, the, the dairy fats and those kinds of things. Those things, I believe, will make a huge difference to the extent that people actually put it to work in their lives. All I can think of is uh, at Easter, we would get together with the family, like the carnivores, I call them. And one of yeah. the dips that came out was bacon and sour cream and this whole mixture. And I'm just like going, okay. And they were scarfing it down and, and yeah, I still have my work cut out for me within well, even with my own family. Well, people haven't heard the risks. They, they're not, uh, they've heard some of the risks. And from you, I'm sure they've heard all of them. But <laughs> they ignore me, though. <laughs> they might ignore you. We've gotten used to certain disease relationships. Smoking causes cancer. So nobody at that table lit up a cigarette, I, I imagine. Um, but, uh, we've gotten that, past that one. We, 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 we have. But, you know, that took a long time, too. And for, for this one, when people hear from you, saturated fat might increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease or increase the risk of cardiovascular disease or increase the risk of diabetes or whatever. People tend to be very conservative with their diet habits and they're slow to change. And eventually, people will get this if for no other reason. If you made a list of all the diseases you don't want to get, Alzheimer's is at the very top of that list. And it's a crushing condition to have. You lose everything. And so... Once we have 
a glimmer of ways that we could cut our risk. And, and by the way, when I talk about cutting the risk, in Chicago, the people who ate the least saturated fat had about two thirds less Alzheimer's than those who ate the most, even if they didn't change anything else in their life. The, the people who, who avoided trans fats had about 80% less um, Alzheimer's compared to the other people, even if they made no other changes in their lives. So you put these things together and you're talking about real power. Now, nothing's gonna make you live forever, but while your heart is beating, let's keep your mind plugged in. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, that's the idea. I mean, that's because this is a huge, huge epidemic that's coming. I mean, with these baby yeah. boomers that are coming in after post-World War II, and we're starting to see these people coming into the nursing homes, and it's huge, absolutely huge. And people are not only concerned about themselves. You know, the last thing you want to do is spend the last five years of your life in the corner of a nursing home dribbling and having somebody else care for you. I think they're even more concerned, and perhaps justifiably so, about what this does to their families. You're abandoning your spouse or your family. You, you can't help them anymore or maybe they are succumbing to this condition. It's, it's a disaster for everybody. It's also a financial disaster. Oh my God. For, so. When she went in at, at 72, it was $4,000. And we're talking not major metropolitan area. We're talking right. you know smaller rural kind of areas. $4,000 to go in. And at the end, set at seven years, it was almost close to $9,000 a month, right. a month. Um, that, yeah, exactly. Per month. So any, anyway, who's going to pay um, that? This, this, well, this is what we're dealing with. So my message as a physician is I don't think I can reduce your risk to zero, but I'm going to reduce it as much as I can. And it, it just means making some adjustments. And the beauty of it is, is that the foods become really enjoyable. When you, when you look at, at these countries where people have been living long lives, they're not complaining about their food. Their food might be simple, but it's delicious and it's um, time honored. And we, we can pick, okay, I want to pick it from an Asian style, a Mediterranean style, a Latin American style. You've got blue zones in all of them. Uh, <laughs> yes. you know, you, yes, and, and so it's, it can be, it can be a, you're not giving up the pleasures of life. You're grabbing the pleasures of life and bringing them in, in close to you. Well, is there a relationship between the cholesterol and Alzheimer's? We think so, yes. Researchers at Kaiser Permanente did an interesting study. They brought in a, a, about 10,000 people and they measured their cholesterol levels. And what they showed was that the higher your cholesterol level, the higher your risk of Alzheimer's. People with the highest cholesterols had the most Alzheimer's risk. So what, what we believe is that in the same way that a high cholesterol is bad for your heart, a high cholesterol level also does some mischief with your brain. We believe it probably affects the production of these amyloid proteins um, or their aggregation into plaques. We're not 100% sure what it's doing there, but but there, something about the cholesterol is a problem. Oh, oh and, and by the way, in this Kaiser study that I just mentioned, when they the, the cholesterol levels they measured were when the people were about 40 years old, meaning it, we imagine, well, when I'm, when I'm young, uh, nothing can really hurt me. The high cholesterol that a person has early in life can predict the risk of Alzheimer's later in life. So, so it is never too early to make some changes. Oh my gosh, yes. Well, as I mentioned, we were, we got the family together and my brother who is, uh, well, we're all, you know, within my family, I'm the only one who's changed, changed my health destiny. And my brother announced or showed me that he was now on a paleo diet. It didn't say paleo, but I, as I'm skimming through, looking through it, it was hundred percent paleo. Right. So let me ask you a question. Do we need meat or dairy products in our life? Oh, we do not. In fact, we're better off without them. The, I think the research is really quite clear. A, we don't need them. B, we're better off without them. And the, the paleo diet is a romantic notion, I think, that, okay, I'm going to live like my spear-wielding forebears. You know, it's, it, it allows you to sort of imagine sort of a macho past where we looked good in our loincloth, maybe suitable for the cover of men's health. Um, and I have to say that it's based on a bit of a fantasy that the, the paleo diet is, as you know, says agriculture is bad. So we're going to eat things that we produced before we figured out how to plant anything. And I mean, th th there's some good to that because it means, uh, for example, dairy products are out. You know, that's all much more recent, recent in the historical view of things, but they then start the period with once people figured out through the Stone Age how to acquire meat, once we had arrowheads and, and knives and, and things like that. So they're looking 
post uh, Stone Age, but before the age of agriculture. So there's this kind of thin band that they're defining as the Paleo period. There's a lot wrong with that. We have pre-Stone Age coronary arteries, pre-Stone Age digestive tracts. So our bodies are really designed for plant foods, and not for the meat products that uh, some people is, are, are thinking of here with paleo. Well, what about fat? I mean, is, is all fat bad? I mean, do we need it? And, yeah. and I got a story I got to share with you after you, you answer this question, because you just go, oh my God. Anyway. Yes. Um, no, go no, not, not all fat is bad. You need fat. There's, there are some essential fats that, that you do need, but I'm not advocating a fat-free diet. What I'm saying is there are traces of fats. If you take broccoli or kale, and take, take a green vegetable, they have traces of fats in them. In fact, they have slightly more fat than you actually need. It's not a lot. It's maybe eight or 9% of its calories, something like that. And in a really good ratio of the omega-3s to the other kinds of fats. And so those are fats you, you should have, and you don't want to to eliminate that, but you don't need animal fat at all. And you don't need bacon grease at all. <laughs> well, I was in, I was in uh, um, Whole Foods and I was shopping. It was not my regular one. And I was looking for a hummus and cause they have different ones. So I was, you know, picking up and being a good label reading, you know, ingredient detective. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I found two that had uh, no oil in it. And so this guy comes up next to me and he goes, Oh my God, there's so many hummuses. What's, what's the difference? You know, which one's good? And I said, oh, these two don't have any oil in this. And this other woman comes up. Now they had tahini, which has, you know, some fat right. in there. Okay. All right. But then this woman comes up and she's overhearing our conversation and she just comes up. And, I'm a medical doctor and, and uh, you need to have oil in your diet. And, and I'm like, how, how, do you, <laughs> how do you respond? I mean, my knee-jerk reaction was like... Um, can you tell me where your practice is so I don't go? But <laughs> yeah. how do you respond to that? Well, people have a lot of opinions and sometimes they're not based very much on fact. And the, the, the truth is you do need some fat, as I, as I mentioned earlier, but the difference is you don't need, you don't need added oils. And if a person takes, let's, let's say olive oil, it sounds nice and sounds like it's part of a wonderful Mediterranean diet. Heart healthy, right? It's well, stamped. It, isn't this it? is, this is what people are saying. Uh, it's, there, there's a whole other side to this, but, but the point I'm making for the moment is that if you eat an olive, you get a trace of olive oil. If you eat broccoli, you get traces of broccoli oil. These are naturally part of it. But to make olive oil, you take 10,000 olives and you press out all the oil and it's concentrated in the same way as you take sugar cane, you pull the sugar out of the cane, now you've got concentrated sugar. So you, we do need traces of oil. They're naturally in the plants that we eat. You don't need to extract the oil and and be drizzling olive oil all over, all over your food and pretending that that's somehow natural. Well, is there a specific amount that we should target or go for, or just it, it will come naturally? It will, well, it will come naturally. The, the amount that you need is just a few percentage uh, points of, the, of your total caloric intake, uh, but, but it comes absolutely naturally. So in our research studies, particularly for people who wanna lose weight or want to tackle diabetes or tackle a cholesterol problem, what we encourage them to do is choose their foods, choose their diet from plant foods. So it's vegetables and fruits and grains and beans and all the foods that come from it. But learn how to cook without adding oils. And what you discover is that there are traces of oils in beans, in vegetables, and fruits. There are these tiny traces of oils that I've been discussing, and it's more than enough for your needs. And then some foods are, are much higher, like nuts and seeds, avocados, in their natural state. They have quite a lot of oil in them. So those are spare. That's what makes them so good. <laughs> that's, well, that's part of it. Once you get habituated to it, yes. But, but that's really kind of it. And, and you don't need to add extra oils. And you definitely don't need to add butter, cheese, the animal fats. Because not only are you adding a lot of fat in the animal product, but it's the worst kind of fat. It's very high. Animal products are very high in these saturated fats that, as we've, we've known for a long time, are linked to heart disease, uh, but then the new scare is that, and rightly so, is that they're linked to Alzheimer's disease. And so that's another reason to avoid animal products. Well, I've heard about the brain. The brain, you know, and this doctor also in the, the grocery store was like, well, your brain has to have, needs lots of fat to run. Okay. Um, well, your brain does have fat in it. That's true. But your tires have air in them. 
That doesn't mean that you have to be pumping air into them every minute of every day any more than you have to be eating fat for your brain, fat in my brain. Your, your brain is able to... <laughs> I love that. That was a good yeah. one. That was a good yeah. one. Yeah, well, well, it's it's, it's true, and y- your your brain does have fat in it that the body has has used, and it doesn't have to be replenished constantly. But as I said earlier, there is there is a requirement for fats in the diet. It's a couple of percent of your uh, of your daily caloric intake, and the two fats you need there's only two fats. One is called alpha linolenic acid. That's the plant based omega three, and the other is linoleic acid. It's the plant based omega six. That's it. And you need tiny traces of them and your body can make all the rest. Well, what about the omega-3? Can that help dementia? Can that help prevent it? If we're speaking, take a supplement, and then we don't have any good evidence at all that that's the case. But I do think that your body does need omega-3 for a lot of reasons. And I'm not speaking of fish oil. There is in many plants, uh, including the green vegetables especially, tiny traces of fat that percentage wise are quite high in omega-3. It's called, this is alpha linolenic acid I was mentioning earlier. This is one that your body needs and your body takes it and it lengthens it to others called EPA and DHA. This will not be on the test, Um, but the brain uses this. And this is another reason not to be adding oil to your foods because the enzymes that lengthen it into the, that lengthen the the ALA into the one that your brain can use. Mm -hmm. If you eat a lot of extra fat, it occupies those enzymes and makes them not work. So keep your enzymes free by not eating a lot of extra grease. And then your enzymes are there and they're happy to take those good healthy fats, those nice alpha linolenic acid that came from your vegetables and lengthen them into the ones that your body can use. So that's the idea. Now, if a person wants to supplement, you can. If you go to the health food store, they will sell DHA in a pill. And some of them come from fish. Some of them come from entirely plant sources. Take the plant sources one if you want. I'm not necessarily promoting this, but they are there and you can use them if you like. Yes, some kinds are, and but fish fat is a mixture. If you go out and get some Chinook salmon because you heard it's really, it's a fatty fish, it's got omega-3, it's true. It's got omega-3. It's got a lot of saturated fat too. It has all the, the fish fats are mixtures. There's some omega-3 and a lot of saturated fat. The amount of saturated fat, that's the bad one, in Chinook salmon is about the same as the amount of saturated fat in roast beef. So it is not as if this is health food. Fish muscle is a lot more like cow muscle than it is like broccoli. I would steer clear of it. And not to mention the fact that fish live in the sewer. I'm talking about the ocean. Um, And that is why they are far and away one of the highest sources of pollutants. I'm talking again about metals and industrial well, chemicals. Well, what about you know, fish farming? Would, would that be better? Yeah, you know, even worse. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you may have seen <laughs> pictures and, and videos of fish living basically one on top of another. And it's, it's peculiar to look at it. People have criticized intensive farming of chickens, or to, and rightly so, or intensive farming of pigs, or intensive farming of cattle. And with good reason, because when you cram animals together, they pass infections one to the other. You give them antibiotics to try to keep them going. And as you probably know, most of the antibiotics produced at, by pharmaceutical companies are consumed by animals on intensive operations. Yeah. Well, that's what's happened with, with fish. You have a fish farm and they are jammed together and they will actually give them antibiotics to try to keep them healthy. So no, I wouldn't go anywhere near it. Environmentally, it's it's terrible. And for your health, you just don't need it. Wow. Well, okay, let's change topics. What about the Mediterranean diet? I mean, I've heard wonderful, you know, people promoting this, that it's healthy. What are your thoughts? I think the Mediterranean diet is a very nice word that, that people use to sort of vaguely mean they can imagine themselves driving down the coast of Tuscany, about to eat some bruschetta and have some red wine. Uh, they're not too sure what the Mediterranean diet, Mediterranean diet really means, but wouldn't it be nice to be there? What, what I'm saying is that people are, they like the, they like the image. Um, they're, not, they're not thinking too much about what the foods are. Now, having said that, the concept really goes back to Ansel Keys, who, when was this? Uh, Mid-1960s? He was really, he lived in Minneapolis and, you know, winters in Minneapolis are no, nowhere near as nice as the, 
winters in Southern Italy. And he was yeah. very, ta- he was very taken with the, not only the culture, but also the fact that, that in Southern Italy, people did quite well with regard to heart health, not, not as, not as good as Japan. And he was one of the first to say Japan was pretty good. Uh, Japan was, was, was the best. Italy was pretty good, but not quite as good as Japan. Anyway, so the, he coined this, this concept of a Mediterranean diet. It's sort of a semi-vegetarian diet. And what was good about it and what has, has emerged as good is that they do eat a lot of healthy things, many vegetables, fruits, whole grains, a lot of beans, chickpeas, and things like that. That's really good. And when people have looked at what are the reasons why a person might live longer, whether it's in southern Italy or in Greece or their neighbors, it's a high intake of plant-based foods. Um, now, a typical Mediterranean diet in southern Italy might include some meat, some fish, a little bit of dairy here and there. But in statistical analyses, despite the fact they do better than Americans do, those who consume even moderate amounts of the animal products do not do as well. So those are the things that, sh- that, that are uh, the limitations of that diet. So a Mediterranean diet, better than a New Jersey diet, for sure. Um, how, however, it's not only not as good as the Okinawa diet, it is not as good as a vegan diet because it's sort of a halfway, halfway there. Um, with regard to alcohol, it's been curious. Pete, I, I'm not recommending alcohol consumption, but the people in the Mediterranean countries who drink a little bit seem to do a little bit better with longevity than those who don't drink at all. And those who drink a lot do substantially worse. They're, they die like flies. But the people who have a little bit of wine seem to do better. And we don't know if there's something either in their lifestyle that helps them or maybe there's something in the wine. I have suspected it's not the alcohol. I suspect it's the anthocyanins, which are the pigments in the wine that are... Resveratrol. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's, yes, there's a whole bunch of them. And they are, they're antioxidants. And I suspect that that's the reason we kind of like to pretend it's the alcohol and a little Jack Daniels will keep me alive longer. Well, well I can just hear Dr. McDougall <laughs> in the back of my head because we always love to hear good things about our bad habits, you know. That, that's right, you know. But, but, but anyway, that's the Mediterranean diet. And I do, think it's, I do think it's substantially better than an American diet, but it's nothing like uh, a truly plant-based diet. Well, has there been a head-to-head with whole food plant-based versus Mediterranean? Sort of. N- not, not exactly head-to-head a perfect plant-based diet or a, a classic Mediterranean, but there have been a couple. Uh, there was a huge study with more than 7,000 participants called Predimed. It was done in Spain. And they randomized participants to three different groups. Two of the groups got a Mediterranean diet. One got basically nothing. And that was the comparison group. The two groups that got the Mediterranean diet were supposed to eat more uh, vegetables and fruits. And one was asked to eat extra olive oil. They gave him a liter of olive oil every week, if you can believe that, and said, cook with this stuff. Oh, my God. I'm not kidding. They did this. And then the other Mediterranean group was following a Mediterranean diet plus nuts, about an ounce a day of nuts. And so it was Mediterranean plus olive oil, extra virgin olive oil. Mediterranean was plus it, was, it, was that processed by virgins on the seventh solstice of the seventh month? I think uh, it must have been, yes. <laughs> anyway. Um, sorry. Yes, I'm with you. And so, okay, Mediterranean plus oil, Mediterranean plus nuts versus nothing. And what happened was a, not a lot with regard to re, uh, reductions in mortality and, uh, or cardiovascular mortality. However, if they looked at a composite endpoint altogether, did you have a stroke? Did you have a myocardial infarction? Did you die of some cardiac problem? There was a benefit to the Mediterranean diet, about a 30% reduction. That was good. Okay, so, uh, it was not huge, but it was there. However, the Predimed researchers went, went one step further. And they said, looking at these 7,000 people, some of them are practically vegetarian, or maybe they were vegetarian, and some of them not at all. And so they said, let's do the, the analysis again. And they looked at those people who fit what they called a pro-vegetarian pattern. So do you eat more vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans and potatoes, all the plant stuff? And you eat less of the animal stuff. And they said, do do you follow a little bit of a pro-vegetarian pattern, a little bit more, or a lot? And suddenly, when they did the statistics, the more that you follow this pro-vegetarian pattern, the less likely you were to die from cardiac disease and the less likely you were to die of anything during the follow-up period that they had. So in other words, being on a Mediterranean Mediterranean diet is good, 
but doing it as a vegan basically is probably the best. So one more, there was a, another study called the CardiVeg study where they assigned people to either uh, what was called a Mediterranean diet uh, plant rich, but not devoid of animal products. And they compared it to a vegetarian diet, which did include some cheese and eggs. So it wasn't ideal. And what they looked at over a three month period was just cholesterol lowering. Mm -hmm. It will not surprise you that the vegetarians had a lower cholesterol than the meat eating uh, Mediterranean people. But I got to tell you one other thing, and forgive me for this long winded answer. You asked me a simple no, question. I, I'm just, go. I'm just going on. Go. Okay. One, one more thing. Go. Take your time. One more thing. This is really important. Oils are fattening. Fats are fattening. Every gram of fat, oil, any, any kind of fat or oil, a gram has nine calories. So let's say I'm taking out all the chicken fat and the beef fat. That's good. That's going to help me with my cholesterol. But if I'm slathering a lot of olive oil back into it, it's going to slow down my weight loss. If I'm going to eat lots of nuts, as healthy as they may be in other ways, they happen to be pretty fatty and they're going to slow down your weight loss too. And in the Predimed trial, the people did not lose weight. They, they lost a trivial amount of weight. But uh, as you know, when we use vegan diets, a low-fat vegan diet is amazing. And it's very predictable. People lose weight. Wow. Uh, it, well, it's true. Absolutely. Right. But in, in interesting, though, when you take away and take out those, those fats, how, yeah, yeah the it, weight does it, come it, down. Exactly. Well, the fat you eat is the fat you hear, wear. I can hear McDougal in the back of my head. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> He's right. Yeah. So to sum it up, we need to avoid fatty foods and focus on a plant-based diet. So what benefits is this going to bring to us? Well, many, many benefits. Um, over the short run, of course, we see weight loss, which starts right away. If a person has diabetes, their blood sugars start to fall. Their blood pressure comes down and their cholesterol levels go down. If they have sore joints, if with rheumatoid arthritis, for example, their joints often feel better because they are not eating the inflammatory triggers. And what we also believe and have good evidence to support is that over the longer term, mm -hmm. the heart attacks are less likely to happen. The cancers, particularly digestive cancers like colorectal cancer and hormone-related cancers like prostate cancer in men, breast cancer in women, less likely to happen too. And that's partly because you're avoiding the bad stuff, you're avoiding meats, but also you're accessing the cancer preventers, which are the vitamin-rich, antioxidant-rich vegetables and fruits. And then when we get out toward older age, the likelihood of developing Alzheimer's, we believe, is going to be less. Now, nobody has done a randomized trial where you're a vegan and you're not, and let's see who gets Alzheimer's. No one ever will do such a study, probably. But nonetheless, uh, we have to go based on the best evidence that we have available to us. And that suggests being really careful with our diet, right. and taking advantage of the foods that come from plants. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I always learn so much when I talk to you. You're just a plethora of knowledge. Well, thank you. It's been great talking with you again. And thank you for sharing this uh, information with all the people who follow you. All right. Well, part four will be coming soon. So I look forward to it.